Good morning and welcome. I am Rochelle Davis, President and CEO of Healthy Schools Campaign. We are an advocacy organization dedicated to making schools healthier places for all children. We are based in Chicago and work at the local, state, and national level with parents, teachers, and other school stakeholders on a range of issues connected to health and equity. This work includes expanding school health services, increasing access to healthy school food, cleaning for health, and building green schoolyards. Today, I am happy to welcome you to our Change for Good Forum at a national priority, investing in public school infrastructure. I wanna thank all of our sponsors for making our Change for Good Forums possible. We are pleased to be holding today's forum in partnership with the Center for Green Schools. And I want to welcome Anissa Hemming, Director of the Center for Green Schools at the US Green Building Council. This morning's forum is about the importance of investing in school facilities to support equity, health, and sustainability. It is happening as our political leaders are discussing whether or not schools should be included in the nation's upcoming investment in infrastructure. We are thrilled to have Senator Dick Durbin here to share his perspective, and we are also very fortunate to have two local leaders with us as well. We will hear from Josina Morita, a commissioner at the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago, who will talk about the important work of building green schoolyards. Rodney Williams, Director of Energy and Sustainability for the Newark Board of Education in New Jersey, will also share his experience supporting schools with significant infrastructure needs. This will end with a brief Q&A with Senator Durbin. Thanks, Rochelle. School building closures during the pandemic and concerns about indoor air quality and safety has, have drawn attention to the disrepair of schools, the inequity that exists around our country and the important role that schools play in supporting student health. We cannot talk about equity in education and health without addressing the critical need for school infrastructure investment. A recent GAO report found that almost half of school districts must replace or update major HVAC systems that affect indoor air quality. And our recent national survey about AIQ and COVID found that the top challenge that schools had in implementing recommendations related to COVID and air quality was that their buildings were not designed to support the recommended strategies. Overall, schools infrastructure needs and the resulting health consequences are greater in high poverty districts, especially those serving Black and Latinx children. Thank you, Anissa. Senator Durbin is with us today to talk about what is happening at the federal level to ensure that schools continue to be a priority for infrastructure investment, and we thank him for his leadership. We have only 30 minutes, so we're going to get started. Please join me in welcoming Senator Dick Durbin. Thanks, Rochelle. It's good to be with you. And uh, uh, particularly be on a program with uh, Josina Morita, uh, a friend of mine of many years, an outstanding uh, public servant here in the state of Illinois. So we have a new president and we have a new approach to things and we're not ignoring the basics. And one of the basics is to make sure that we invest in our schools. Uh, our most valuable resource, our kids and our grandkids spend a big part of their lives in that building, hopefully with a positive learning experience, but also hopefully with a positive health experience. We want to make sure, particularly in this era of pandemic, that we're doing everything we can to modernize. And this uh, made a point earlier and a very important one, that the HVAC system is no longer just heating and cooling. It's also the question of how air is circulated and whether that circulation is mindful of the realities that we face with public health today. We have a long path uh, to go uh, in, in fighting this COVID-19. It begins with vaccinations, but we should take a look at the long-term view. Sadly, we've seen a recurrence of these pandemics on a regular basis in the last few decades. I hope to God we'd never face anything like we just went through uh, or going through it at the moment, but we'd be fools to ignore the obvious. These challenges could come back to haunt us. President uh, Biden has told us, and I think puts it in a few words very succinctly, 
We've got to build back better. It isn't enough to go back to the good old days. We want to make sure there are better days ahead. And he recently visited Crystal Lake in McHenry County in Illinois just two or three days ago and, and drove that message home. Building back better means investing in healthy and safe classrooms and schools for our kids, something I think we can accomplish in the infrastructure package, which the president is supporting and I support as well. I'm also an original co-sponsor of the Reopen and Rebuild America Schools Act, uh, and I believe the Amer American Jobs Plan of the president will complement that in terms of school infrastructure. The American Jobs Plan of President Biden would invest $100 billion to modernize school buildings. We talked about HVAC, energy efficient technology, and improving school kitchens. We also need to expand access to broadband and internet services. Uh, we know now how critically important that was during the pandemic and will be again. We have to invest $45 billion. And this is a problem that is really, I'm sad to say, uh, a major one in Illinois, Josina, I'm sure is aware of it, and that is replacing all the lead pipes and service lines in buildings and homes across my state. Sadly, we lead the nation in this deadly um, part of our infrastructure. Uh, that incidentally, we estimate will nationwide affect 400,000 schools and child care facilities, just to make sure that the water that our kids and grandkids are drinking is safe. Wouldn't we want that as one of the basics that we're gonna do in America? Some of my folks on the other side of the aisle think uh, this is just way too much government. I couldn't agree or disagree more. I believe their approach is short-sighted. If we cannot invest in the buildings that protect and serve our children and families, where are our priorities? After all, no student should need to wear a winter coat inside a classroom or question the quality or safety of the drinking water because of lead pipes, or be concerned about the air that they breathe in the era of pandemics. I hope that we can, on a bipartisan basis, work to get this done. We have a president who cares. Uh, we have a thin majority in the uh, House and, and an almost invisible majority in the Senate. But thanks to Kamala Harris, we can make some uh, critical votes when we can bring all the Democrats together. So let me stop at this point and uh, go on with the program and answer your questions. Well, thank you so much, um, Senator Durbin. We appreciate your leadership um, and we will get to those questions. Um, but first, um, we are going to hear from our two uh, uh, local leaders. Um, when we talk about the needs of schools, we have to include schoolyards um, in the discussion. Um, many schoolyards across the country are inadequate for safe play and use. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Commissioner Docina Morita from the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago to talk about the district's involvement with Space to Grow, an effort to build green schoolyards in communities of color that support student health and learning, while also address climate resilience. Healthy Schools Campaign is proud to manage space to grow with our partner, Open Lands. Josina, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you, Rochelle, and for being such a leader on these issues. Uh, um, it's been great to be a partner. My name is Josina Morita. I'm a commissioner at the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District and always happy to talk about my favorite program, uh, Space to Grow. Uh, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, I would say is one of the most important agencies nobody knows exists. We're a $1 billion agency that does storm and sewer water here in Cook County, the second largest county in the country. Uh, one of the things that we're most known for is the Deep Tunnel Project, one of the largest infrastructure projects in U.S. history that when it's completed will house two of the largest stormwater reservoirs in the world. Um, and I say that to also highlight the fact that when it's done, it'll hold the equivalent of half of an inch of rain on the county surface. And to say that is to say, we cannot just dig our way out of this problem, that we have to invest in on-site capture, increasing impermeable surfaces and space to grow is one of the dynamic programs that does that, but does so much more. And that's what I think the power of infrastructure and particularly investing in schools can do is that it helps us address our stormwater challenges, but it also has so many more benefits for people and communities. 
Um, so really proud of Space to Grow that has uh, improved over 30 different uh, schoolyards across the city of Chicago, impacting over 11,000 students and capturing over 4.5 million gallons of water in a single event. Um, across the Chicago area. And it's really a dynamic partnership between Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, but also with the city of Chicago's Department on Water Management, Chicago Public Schools, um, Open Lands, and of course, Healthy Schools Campaign. And you can see from some of these photos, it's taking these impermeable surfaces, oftentimes asphalt and concrete um, playgrounds or schoolyards and transforming them into these really beautiful uh, stormwater um, uh, schoolyards that are community driven. There's a whole process that engages and empowers residents. Um, it's really an equitable approach in that it, it really uh, focuses. We have a whole matrix around equity, which I'm really proud of, to prioritize schools in low-income communities of color, to engage residents, families, and students around a broader vision that they have for their communities, um, and schools really being at the center of it. Um, so it is creating these really beautiful, healthy green spaces um, that aren't just physical structures. They're creating healthier kids, um, more successful students. We've seen that with the increase um, in activity that kids go through when these uh, playgrounds are done, not just during PE during the school uh, year, but because they truly are community driven and community owned uh, students, but also their families are utilizing these playgrounds after hours on the weekends in the summer, really creating just a healthier community and healthier spaces that help us reduce things like childhood obesity. Um, but also um, have shown to increase learning uh, for the students at these schools as we create these healthier spaces. So it's incredibly important to, to me and to all of our partners that it is equitable, um, which is a priority. It's creating these healthy spaces. And then it's also helping us create green spaces and be more resilient um, as a community. And there is no place uh, that I think can be more important, uh, more meaningful to do this kind of work than our schools. We know that our schools are not just physical buildings, they are the center of communities. It is where our children spend most of their time. Um, it's where families can come together in a safe space. It's where communities are able to really reclaim this space as their own. Um, and so it's such an exciting partnership. Uh, the, the role of schools, um, in this project has been transformative. I've seen it myself. I've come out and helped paint murals um, and do ribbon cuttings and hear the stories of parents and students who are so grateful and so excited and so empowered through this process. Um, and it's really just a beautiful example to me about how infrastructure can be so much more than just infrastructure um, and have these multiplier benefits that really transform spaces but transform communities. So thank you all and thank you for this partnership. Again, it's, it's one of my favorites. It's one of the programs that really makes me happy to talk about. So thank you so much. Thank you, Josina, for that amazing example of, of cross-sector collaboration, innovation. With, with those kinds of best practices in place, the availability of federal dollars has the potential to have really far-reaching impact. Thanks for that example. Uh, as I mentioned in our introduction today, the recent survey conducted by the Center for Green Schools asked school districts about the air quality strategies that they were able to implement during COVID to protect students and teachers. The survey found that many districts struggled to implement recommended air quality strategies because their buildings were just not designed to provide the filtration and ventilation recommended. So to help us understand the challenges faced by facilities directors all over the country, and the potential impact of federal dollars. It is my pleasure to introduce Rodney Williams, Director of Energy and Sustainability with Newark Board of Education. Take it away, Rodney. Sorry, I almost forgot to mute myself. I was <laughs> getting going. But uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Rodney Williams from Newark Public Schools, uh, Newark Public Board of Education, rather. And, uh, just to give you a sense, the Newark Board of Education consists of about 70 schools and we're growing uh, with approximately 10 million square feet of surface that we manage. Uh, we can turn to the next slide. And there are, there are over 
the, the buildings age-wise is about 150 years old and older. Some buildings ha um, have full ventilation while others have little to no ventilation. Now, it's, it's, it's important to note that uh, when, we, when we think about ventilation and how important it is, during the COVID, it really it, it exposed a few things that we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, it, we, we, the, it was an article that I'd like to just talk, talk about here. It says in this article entitled, um, Ventilation and, and the Coronavirus is an important approach to lowering the concentration of indoor air pollutants and contaminants, including any virus that may be in the air, is to increase ventilation. Ventilation and, and air infiltration, air, air filtration rather, helps reduce the risk of the virus that causes COVID-19. And this is from EPA. Now the Newark Board of Education at the time spent $275,000 in ESSA funding to purchase the recommended uh, MERV 13 filters on our existing mechanical assist, uh, systems. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, we did a, a survey and 42% of the classrooms have only radiators with no mechanical fresh air. 41% of the classrooms have unit vents and with those unit vents, uh, there was a limited amount of fresh air that we could receive from those particular unit vents. And 15% of the classrooms have full mechanical systems where we can not only have the proper ventilation, but also air conditioning in, in, in those in the buildings. We go to the next slide. What I want to do is just show some examples. Univents were invented around 1917. Now, when I mentioned uh, we have schools over 150 years old, we have a school that uh, came online 1848. And just to put it in perspective, the 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, was inaugurated in 1861. So just to show you that we have systems older uh, than, uh, matter of fact, I know older than all of, all of us, but just shows you the technology. We have some that are, uh, we have new schools that just came online with, of course, up-to-date state-of-the-art technology. And as you see an example here, one building, uh, 1957 was a unit um, and that's supposed to provide outside air. And the other one, we don't know what date it is, but that's in one of our older schools that's over 100 years old. So basically, you can see the, the, the need for ventilation. If we go to, to, to the next slide, we'll give, an, give another ex example of a newer unit, a more modern unit, as I mentioned. And if you see the arrow, it points to one of the MERV 13 filters that we put in. And then our next slide, which is an interesting thing, um, it, it shows 41, 42% of our, our buildings are just radiators, no ventilation at all. So we see that there is a need for proper ventilations in the school. If we go to our next slide, despite the challenges that we, we have with providing ventilation and, and, and a, a, air, a room conducive for, for student learning, we as, as Board of Education, no Board of Education received uh, Bronx uh, Sustainability certi certi Certification for about 61 of our buildings. Um, and this opened the way for additional funding to do additional things in the building. And also because of uh, the vastness of, of, of uh, such a, a prestigious award, the, the Sustainable Jersey for Schools awarded the district the 2020 Sustainable Make Sense Award. And we're proud of that. And in conclusion, our final slide, um, the Board of Education of Newark has gone to great length to make sure that we combat this COVID-19 virus and it, it exposed things for us a little bit when it comes to ventilation. And we did a survey that when we think about the age of our buildings, the mechanical system and so forth, it would take approximately $350 million to properly ventilate and air condition our schools. So additional funding is sorely needed to help bring our buildings up to the indoor air quality standards. Thank you all for listening. Well, Rodney, thank you so much. You and your team are clearly one of the frontline heroes in this fight against COVID. And I, 
I just, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for everything that you are doing. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers and acknowledge that Commissioner Morita is leaving a bit early for a bill signing, um, but I do want to give Senator Durbin an opportunity um, to um, comment on what he has heard from our two local examples before we pepper him with a few questions. I think uh, both of your witnesses, if we can characterize them that way, have created a, an honest analysis of what we face in today's schools. And uh, from Josita's point of view, a vision of where we can go forward uh, to make these schools healthier and a more positive experience. Uh, I, I just have to say what I've opened with, if we can't give our kids and grandkids whom we dearly love an environment to learn uh, that is safe, healthy and nurturing, shame on us. Uh, we have responsibilities as parents and grandparents to leave a better, better world for our kids and giving them off to a good start in our schools is essential uh, for, for that to occur. Now we have a president who's committed to it, but we also have some political realities. When we return to Washington next week for four weeks or five of session, uh, one of the first things we will consider is infrastructure. We have discussed this in the past. We are not just talking about horizontal infrastructure, we're talking about vertical infrastructure, which means including buildings and other uh, forward thinking that can make America better, such as uh, expansion of broadband. <clears throat> so we will have the debate. Uh, I am hopeful. I think the Democrats that I serve with and many of the Republicans are ready to do the right thing. I hope we can get that done in the next few weeks. Well, uh, thank you. And that leads right into, I think, my first question. And just to make sure our audience, you know, understands that the current bipartisan infrastructure agreement does leave out schools. So it really does appear that our only chance for a significant federal investment in school infrastructure will be through the budget reconciliation. What do you see your role being to ensure that Congress passes school infrastructure, infrastructure funding through that process that meets the $130 billion level included in the Rebuild America Schools Act? Well, it's, it sounds very simple, but it is the challenge, and that is to make sure that all 50 Democrats support it. Uh, if we have a reconciliation bill with all 50 Democrats, Kamala Harris, the vice president, has the authority to break the tie in our favor. If we don't have that approach, then anything we do is subject to a filibuster that is requiring 60 votes, which means we need at least 10 Republicans and I, I doubt if we have 10 Republicans supporting what we're discussing this morning. I hope I'm wrong, but I think that's probably accurate. So uh, the first goal is to get all 50 Democrats together. And uh, as Whip, who is uh, charged with counting votes, uh, that's what I'm all about. Well, and, and as a follow-up, what do you think are the strongest arguments for considering schools part of your nation's infrastructure? What do you see as resounding with your colleagues? Well, I think there's two, two things. I mean, I, I could appeal to their uh, ideals, as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to our kids and grandkids. But secondly, I would like to suggest to them that um, if we have improvement of our health, uh, improvement uh, of our schools uh, as a goal, it lessens the pressure to raise local property taxes to make up the difference. And I can't think of, of uh, maybe healthcare clinics and schools as a category of their own, uh, where that should be a priority in this country because we know how essential they are to so many families. Um, and there are also other avenues for getting limited federal assistance to schools for facility improvements and upgrades. Can you tell us about any other bills that you support that would support school facilities and school grounds? Well, I mentioned earlier that there is a bill uh, uh, beyond uh, what has been offered by President uh, Biden uh, with the American uh, Jobs Plan uh, that I have co-sponsored. I'm looking up the name here to make sure I get it right. Hold on tight. It is the Reopen and Rebuild American Schools Act. Uh, and, and it is just spot on to the issues that we have raised here. I think the action is gonna be with the Biden budget uh, and it's going to be on this reconciliation bill, whether something uh, like this separate bill could be included is a question we can't answer at this moment, but the focus is getting all 50 Democrats on the same page 
uh, when it comes to putting in this kind of a resource. Um, and then I also believe there is a School Food Modernization Act that yes. Senator Collins has put forward that would target the need for investment in kitchen facilities in particular. Are you supporting that? Looking at it right now, it says 90% of schools need at least one piece of updated kitchen equipment. Collins and Smith, I'm, I'm sure that's Tina Smith. Well, I'm not sure, but I think it's probably Tina Smith of Minnesota. Uh, introduce oh, this bill. Oh, oh. Our staff is reviewing that uh, at the moment. I, okay. I, I'm, in, I'm inclined to say yes, but I want to uh, defer to my learned staff, which <laughs> makes recommendations to it. Well, and I'm going to sneak in one last question then. Um, a little bit off topic on infrastructure, but kind of very connected to pits and following up on the kitchen question. Um, you know that Congress will also be um, looking at another really important issue the Child Nutrition Reauthorization Act. And I think that COVID also underscored the importance of the school meal program to address hunger and nutrition. Um, a reauthorization that expands access and strengthens nutrition standards is critical. Where do you stand? And you play a really critical role on that issue also. Where do you stand on increasing access and bringing school meals into alignment with dietary guidelines? Well, uh, let me just say, uh, I'm on the Agriculture Committee. I fully support these programs. I'm glad that you mentioned nutritional guidelines because I, I think we have to be mindful that many of the school feeding programs uh, are not where they should be. Uh, we need to expand the opportunities for nutrition education and nutrition opportunities for children. I have visited public schools in my state and been embarrassed by what they serve the kids. I'll be just honest with you. Corn dogs and pizza are, are hardly the entrees that kids ought to be facing for their school lunch, but many times that's it. Uh, I'm for making a, a more sincere effort to provide uh, not only nutritious, but appealing meals. It does us no good to put the very best food in front of these kids and have them dump it in the trash. Uh, we wanna make sure that we uh, present it in a way that is appealing. For example, I went to, uh, a school that is uh, very close to my apartment in Chicago uh, and found that they were offering a salad bar for uh, kindergarten and first graders and the kids were jumping at it. They loved it because they got to make their own plates and they were putting colorful things on it. Uh, we just had to slow them down before they took too much more than they could eat. But the notion it was to give them something that, that looked appealing and was different and was really good for them. Uh, and there isn't enough investment in, in, in many of the school nutrition programs along those lines. Well, th thank you so much, Senator Durbin, and thank you everyone for participating today. I wanna thank you so much for your leadership. Um, and if there's anything we can do um, to be helpful as you uh, lead the charge, hopefully on both of these issues, when you get back to Washington, you know where to get us. Um, I know. Uh, Thank you for your leadership in this. It is invaluable uh, and it really is going to help a lot of kids. I like that. And I want to thank our speakers and the Center for Green Schools for co-sponsoring today's forum and many thanks to our generous supporters of the Change for Good forums. Um, if you would like to make a donation to support this work, please follow the link in the chat. And thanks again and have a wonderful day.